Uh, now, next up is going to be uh, Fred Kleber, uh, K9VV. Uh, Fred, um, actually, uh, his roots actually go back to the amateur radio station at the Hurricane Center, WX4NHC. He actually uh, worked with Julio and his uh, crew while he was living in South Florida before he moved to the Virgin Islands. Uh, and he escaped um, any major hurricane impacts for a while there until 2017, when, of course, they had significant impacts from not just one but two hurricanes, Irma and Maria. So Fred's going to step up here to talk about uh, their response, their recovery, and a lot of work that they are now doing proactively to their communications and their amateur radio communications. So ladies and gentlemen, Fred Kleber, K9VV. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the uh, nice intro there. I am Fred Kleber, K9 Victor Victor. Some of you may know me on HF. Uh, a little better is November Papa 2 X-ray, a call we use in uh, various contests and the like. Yeah, it was uh, not a fun year in 2017 in the Virgin Islands. Um, it's one thing to read about it, and it's another thing to be right in the middle of it. And as you can see, the, uh, the Virgin Islands uh, is kind of in the middle of the uh, hurricane belt in the Caribbean. So where exactly is the USVI? Our neighbors here are, uh, whoops, how about that? Puerto Rico. A lot of folks think that uh, USVI, well, you know, just a little bit past Miami or just past the Bahamas. Well, uh, we are due south of Halifax, believe it or not. <coughs> and when we look at traveling, oh, it's just a flight to the west coast, right? We're equidistant between San Francisco and Lisbon, Portugal, so flying to the West Coast for us is kind of like flying to Europe. Uh, we're also just north of Venezuela by about 450 miles or so, 600 clicks. We are a territory of the United States, pre-storm, about 100,000 people, and uh, quite a few of those have left. And, but the, uh, the island is, the, the territory is, is doing much better. We do have three EOCs, which make for a little bit of a uh, logistical challenge, especially knowing that one might be hit and the other may not, so you don't know which one's always going to be in charge. And then, of course, when both of them get hit, then you have uh, a little bit of a problem. I'll speak to that a little in a moment here. From a commercial standpoint, tourism is a very important part of our economy, as is the distilling of rum. We have two distilleries on island and uh, also a refinery which is just about ready to come back online after several years of being out of service. So let's talk a little bit more from an emergency management perspective. As I said, we're islands so you can't really evacuate anywhere. So we're told you need to shelter in place. And from an emergency management standpoint, we're a long way from the mainland where most of our resources are going to come from. And we're told, don't even plan on anybody showing up for 96 hours, a little longer than most. It's not like we have uh, the county next door who can come and send firefighters or policemen or uh, state guard in any numbers. They're just, they're nowhere near us. So locally, we do have the Virgin Islands National Guard, numbering of approximately 400. And uh, then, of course, our friends at FEMA, who we've gotten to know very well over the past couple of years or so. Our role in the Virgin Islands as amateurs uh, is a little different than the traditional role that hams typically play. I say that because the, the government has, uh, the Virgin Islands territorial government has no paid communicators. So the hams are it. We're, we're the front line. So we're really functioning more as government communicators and, than hams, but we wear both hats. Um, this is an example of the main EOC in St. Croix, which was totally constructed by hams from a pile of radio stuff that was going to get thrown out. I do want to comment, I, I meant to say it up front, uh, I am not an employee of the territory of the Virgin Islands. Uh, anything I say is my own opinion only, and it does not reflect any way, shape, or form uh, any government entity. So, totally built and staffed by hams. You can see we have, uh, this is a Rockwell Collins HF, 
for uh, FEMA. We have uh, one ham set here. Um, there's a number of commercial trunk systems and other uh, conventional repeaters that are there. And then our, uh, our white boy here, which was our, our friend during these, these two storms. St. John was, has a much smaller EOC with a much smaller population, and you can see uh, they didn't fare too well. And, and believe it or not, the EOC is down here, so it was constantly, constantly raining on them for a week or so following the storm, but they, uh, they stayed there. We had one ham who actually came back to St. John for the storm. Think about that. He knew it was a five, and he came back for it. This is his home station. Gilly and P2OW is his call, and he was... Uh, our main link to St. John for the first week after the storm. Oh, Let's back up. We've all taken our ICS classes, right? Well, training took on a whole new important meaning after these storms. We're requ we require anybody that's working in the EOCs to have the core one, two, seven, and eight classes. However, we encourage them to go on and take 300, 400, where you really get to use those skills in a realistic classroom scenario. And of course, they always throw all the crazy injects in, like, oh, yeah, how about another Cat 5 coming to visit you right after one's already been there? Or how about your EOC getting flooded out and you have to move? Or how about somebody shooting fireworks at a helicopter pad? You know, just crazy things people do. But they make you think. How about that last, second to last one there? Your, your relief that comes to help you has to evacuate. And then uh, guess what? <laughs> These things can and do happen. And you're going to see some examples of that. So the HAMs are frontline communicators for the uh, emergency management agency. We not only build and operate these comm centers. We, we program radios and help out other agencies when they have questions, even uh, federal folks like National Park Service, who we work very closely with, Fish and Wildlife, uh, even FEMA. Uh, they, they come to us for help, and we help them. And they help us. One thing that's really important is we have a lot of hams sprinkled throughout the community, and ham radio enjoys a very good reputation in the Virgin Islands due to things like Hugo and other uh, incidents of the past. Last one's kind of interesting there. This was something that we really didn't anticipate, but as we started seeing that we had a lot of helicopters landing at a single landing pad on the island of St. John, we put our hands up and said, hey, we, we, need, to, we need to help get some order out of chaos here. And I'll talk about that in a second. It's all right, what do you do before a storm? Family first. You, you got to take care of your family, and uh, you got to make sure you're prepared. Don't become a victim yourself. Go out and look at your entire pool of Aries hams. We have folks that come and live part-time on island and go back to the States or wherever. Who's going to be around? Who happens to be on vacation? Who's, who's qualified? You might have a ham there, but I don't need to discuss the pitfalls of putting an unqualified amateur in a very highly visible public uh, function. And who can help and wants to help? So make your list up, schedule shifts, knowing they're gonna change. We had one guy, he hit a telephone pole driving in on his first shift. He was out for the rest of the storm. You make your plan, it'll change, but at least you have a plan. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, Irma. Irma came to the north of St. Croix and you can see here's uh, St. Croix is right, right here. And uh, this is uh, St. Thomas, St. John, and then BVI. So we, we got a glancing blow, but uh, St. John and St. Thomas weren't so lucky. Fortunately, there was an awful lot of government media telling people to prepare. This is real. This is not your standard one or two that blows over and we don't pay much attention to it. I won't bore you with reading all these facts. I'm sure everybody can read, but uh, this, was, this was a very strong storm. And 
believe it or not, the wind's not always the issue. The tidal surge out of these things was unbelievable, as you'll see in some of the other photos here. Twin eye walls, that was a little different twist that doesn't always come about, and I'm sure there'll be some folks talking about that later on that know much more about it. We didn't sit there and count them. We just read about it afterwards. So as I mentioned, St. John, St. Thomas got smacked really well. Even to the point of bark being stripped off of trees, that's pretty humbling when you see that. Only four deaths, though, from Irma. Come on. Oop, there we go. Here's some of the damage. This was a high rise in St. St. Thomas that actually had the, uh, I think these were hallways where the end got blown out, and sadly one person perished there. This is a, this is a home in St. John. That's all that's left. It looks like the kitchen counter or something. And this is probably $7 million worth of boats over in Tortola. I think that's from uh, the moorings, a popular charter place. Okay, I talked about the landing zone management function that is not really something that we were intending. We have one helipad on the island of St. John. It has a small medical center and it seemed everybody wanted to get in to, and get out of St. John. So we went to the EMA, said, look, we got an issue, we'll need to tell us to go handle it. Here's another one of those things you never think about. How many of you sitting in the EMA would know how to give hand signals to a helicopter? <laughs> I got one, two, three. Okay, well we managed to find an <laughs> managed to find an internet connection and teach it to a couple of hams and a security guard at the hospital. And uh, Guess what, that's in our list of next learnings for the next time. We had as many as 12 landings in a day. That may not seem like a lot. Uh, we had private choppers dropping people off, and, or I mean picking people up and animals and all that stuff. We had the military running called what they call their air bridge, dropping off pallets of water and stuff like that. Gee, how long does one of those guys sit on the uh, helipad and tie it up? But of course, medivacs were our main, our main uh, concern there. We had one incident where I had a med chopper coming from Puerto Rico, and it was very obvious when I was speaking to the chief that he was the chief and what he said went. And he said, I have five to 10 minutes of extra fuel on that chopper, and if that landing pad's not clear, I'm gonna turn him around and bring him home. Ooh. Yes, sir, we'll make sure it's uh, clear. So these were some of the things that came up that were uh, real important to us. Sadly, we didn't have comms with the choppers until they, uh, the, the military choppers until they went and found hams on the boats and said, yeah, you have an HT. So they were on our two meter repeater. It's kind of noisy when they were talking from the cockpit, but we were able to t speak with them. Another learning, make sure you know what frequency those military choppers use. They didn't even have any standard air comm frequencies. And then, as I mentioned, make sure that landing zone is uh, clear so you can, uh... oh. <laughs> wait, choppers gotta be able to land first, right? This is a snapshot from Web EOC, which uh, we use for managing. Here's a uh, priority medic vac, and right below it, we had some bonehead shooting off fireworks. No chopper's gonna land if they see any of that. Thankfully, the police got on that one quickly, but again, you can't make this stuff up. It just happens. Oh. <laughs> Here's another one. All those hundreds of FEMA workers that came to help out, guess what? See ya. Another one coming, we gotta leave. This is one of the Coast Guard's larger ships in St. Thomas that uh, you can see there's some pretty good surge to put a big ship up like that on uh, dry land. Hey Julio, remember this? <laughs> Julio is our buddy. What's going on, Julio? What's this thing gonna do? And uh, sadly, this was, uh, this is what was coming our way. Guess what? This was a real thing. Kind of humbling. And thanks. Also, uh, Ken's not here, but thanks to all the great folks at the Hurricane Center. Rob, Bobby, salute you guys. Okay. Maria was a big one, <laughs> tenth strongest in history in the Atlantic. 
Again, I'm not going to bore you with reading the details here, but it, uh, it messed a lot of things up. 95% of our utility poles in St. Croix were down. So you're basically, for a start, having to rebuild your entire electrical grid. We have very little power underground, but they're working uh, to get more of it. Only three deaths. People listened. In fact, our governor got on the phone and said, if you're not going to shelter for the storm, at least tattoo your name and your social security number on your wrist so we can identify you. Guess what? That, that seemed to ring, uh, resonate very strongly with some of the islanders. But of course, after Maria came by us, uh, off it went to Puerto Rico, and that's where our, most of the media function was, since you have so many more people there. Uh-oh. Something happened here. Okay. Uh, I, I mentioned the storm surge. This is a 38-foot uh, power yacht. This is a 50-foot catamaran, just by uh, comparison. It's like these things were thrown around like toys. Uh, here's some of the... Th these are live power, power poles. In fact, we had to stop the uh, propane truck and say, look, don't go down that road. This actually was the hospital, kind of a la mesh. And this was one of the uh, relief vehicles that can pump out 1,500 gallons of water a day for all the uh, soldiers who were um, dispatched to the island afterwards. All right. I don't need to tell many folks in this room, but Huravac is a great tool. It's the one I trust. It uses NHC data. You can read everything else you want, but when the push comes to shove, this is the one we go to. And it was amazingly accurate. So, again, thanks to our friends at NHC. Okay. Here's another one. <laughs> okay, got to close the EOC down and move it. Where's your plan? This is normally a uh, water gut that's about six, seven feet deep. It borders. This is the EOC parking lot right here. Had a big foam pole and a bunch of transformers and stuff fall into this thing and impede the water flow. It came within four inches of flooding out our EOC. It literally would be coming right through the uh, floor of the EOC. We did have three quarters inch of water in the comms room, but that's another issue. It's kind of interesting. You get out of your cot and splash, splash. Just some of the things you deal with. Then when all this stuff blows over, guess what? You see that first chopper and you say, there's our boys. It's a very good feeling, trust me. <laughs> then you look offshore, and you see these big giant ships. I'll show you, well, in the next slide, you'll see the pictures of them. All this activity starts happening. We had to go find out, oh, who's sending all these choppers? When are they going to come? Can we, like, try and sync with some things? <laughs> and they, oh, well, here's our flight ops plan. Um, excuse me, we don't know how to read it. Can you help us? So. It's kind of humbling walking up to a, a commander of some big DOD, I think it was Region 2, saying, um, hi, I'm Fred the ham guy. Even after you walk into a big door, it says DOD only. And Anyway, they, uh, they worked with us very well. But it was, it was really nice to have that, that support, especially AWRO was right there. Uh, how, many, how many HF kits you want? We said, just give us two. We have enough radio equipment on the island. And once we found out how bad Maria hit Puerto Rico, we said send those there. This was a long haul, 2,300 hours in a little over a month. And then, then came the Army, the linemen. They're local heroes here. And to this day, we still have billions in grant money and relief and everything still pouring into the territory. Here's the, uh, the three ships, the three main ships. I'll talk about here in a little bit. We had daily nets with them on 60 meters. 5 megahertz. That proved to be a very, very good means of communication. After these things, information is key. There's such a vacuum. People want to know. It's just simple stuff. Well, when's the air, you know, what, what's curfew? What's the port condition? Just getting that information out is so, so important. FEMA saw this as an HF event. They knew the infrastructure wasn't there to support it properly. So they got uh, Mr. Pye, or Chairman Pai at the FCC to uh, grant a uh, special temporary authorization for the ships to use 60 meters. And if you look at any of these AF, you know, 4 EMA, those are all FEMA call signs. 
And that's where we had the majority of our interface with the uh, military folks from DOD. We also were able to support Puerto Rico. <coughs> Believe it or not, we had uh, a number of supporting roles to Puerto Rico after they got hit too. Look at that bottom one. One repeater, one ham repeater in the whole territory was left. And we were doing HT level coverage to that chopper pad on St. John, 40 miles. Wasn't always perfect. Let's talk a little bit more about all the communication that's going on. You know, we, we listen to the FEMA guys in there. Roger, yep, okay. You know, they kind of dictatious, but we're hams, right? Every log's got to be a golden log. In the contesting community, that means no errors. And when people's lives are involved, you really got to be sure it's right. One really important thing that I remembered, and many of my uh, the staff that were working with us there thought it was nuts. But when, that get, when it really gets important, slow down. The FEMA guys were looking at us like we were nuts. But guess what? We, we made sure that traffic was right. We had a 24-year-old female who had DKA. I, was, I happened to be on the radio. 24-year-old female DKA, medevac from blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay, uh, DK, DKA, uh, let me confirm. Is that Delta Kilo Alpha? Well, yeah, DKA. Uh, no. Well, let me confirm again. Delta Kilo Alpha. Well, yeah. Diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, no, let me confirm again. Delta Kilo Alpha. Please confirm yes or no. That's so important. She made it, by the way. Good feeling. Other things? Try and anticipate what the person's going to ask you. You know, if they order something, do you guys need this or that to go with it? Now, they were maybe over, overreaching our mantra a bit as just communicators, but it's important to try and get as much information as you can. Because a lot of times those folks at the other end, they're under as much stress as you are and aren't thinking about it. Or you have the visibility that the EOC is looking for certain things, and this may be a person that could point you in the right direction. Let's see. Yeah, pay attention to, to things that can easily be uh, misunderstood or miscopied. Directions, quantities. You know, we, we ordered 10 cases of water, not 100. And it happens, trust me. <laughs> We've seen it. Stay calm. Believe me, it's real easy to feel that emotion on the other end, but keep your cool. It also makes that person on the other end very calming also. You guys do a great job on the hurricane out of that. It's always methodical, friendly. So, again, congratulations. We actually didn't do a lot of uh, weather traffic as uh, uh, weather reporting as we are more involved in the government side. You never know who's going to be on the end of the microphone. If they can go fast, give it to them fast, as long as it's a uh, golden log there. Have your MCOM call history. Make sure if they say call public works or I need the number for this or that or who do I call at the hurricane center that you have all that information beforehand. It's real easy to do. Make sure you take care of yourself, get enough sleep, stay hydrated, get enough food. Don't burn yourself out. Don't burn yourself out. It's real easy to do. You're not Superman. <laughs> We're not as young as we used to be, you know. Can't stay out all night anymore, kids. And then there's the uh, final bullet there that's uh, the payoff. The multipliers in a contest or, you know, states or countries or whatever. But here it's how many lives did we save, how many people did we connect, and how many people did we comfort. Kind of along that same, li uh, same line, to me, this happens to be one of the most enjoyable pieces of our hobby is doing something I like doing to, to help people out. And it's, it's really cool when people say, hey, thanks. You know, we appreciate what you guys do. And some want to make you superheroes and all that stuff. It's like, no, 
Guess what? This is what we train for. This is what we do. If you appreciate it, say thank you. That's what we're looking for. And the FCC recognizes this, this too. That's why we get access to all these billions and billions of dollars of radio spectrum that fill in your favorite cell carrier, pays a lot of money for a piece of paper for a license. These guys were all over the sky like mosquitoes, man. The amount of stuff they can bring in is unreal. Our local airport was transported into a military base 24-7. They, they brought in a lot of stuff. People say, what was it like? Well, I said it was kind of like being somewhere between a KOA campground and a Super 8. We were out of power for uh, 105 days. This was some signs that folks put up. This is around Christmas, Christmas time. By, by the time the power folks got around and the linemen uh, had a sense of humor and they said, hey, you know, there is Santa Claus. We're happy to help you. And these guys, they're still visible today rebuilding the power grid. They got everybody hooked back up, and now they're hardening it. And this was just kind of a typical morning down at the local supermarket of these guys, a the whole army of them. And the locals really appreciate them, too. In the end, though, you know, it all, it all begins with people. That person you knew down at the store, you never knew they did this or that and all that. These are some folks from uh, National Park Service. Actually, one of these guys became a ham. I'll talk about that in a second. This is, uh, we had one ham come from the States to help us. George, N1 Echo Zulu Zulu, uh, was sent over to St. John to work with Gilly. And uh, these are some of the local linemen here. Bet you haven't uh, heard this before, right? Anybody under age 50 here? One, two, enough said. Embrace those new hams. We've had uh, quite a bit of activity. These are some school kids. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong one. We, we actually have uh, a couple school kids that started a ham club in their grade school in St. John. They love to go to school with their HTs and the teachers try and bust them, say, you can't have a cell phone. They say, nope, these are amateur radio. So, and they already have permission from the principal to put antennas up. So a lot of good things going on. A lot of great folks that have uh, given time to upgrade, become VEs. And it's really neat seeing these new hams get into it. You know, we remember what it was like. Okay, from an infrastructure standpoint, I mentioned we had one repeater. So we have our three main islands here, St. John, St. Thomas, and St. Croix. I was fortunate to get a grant. We purchased... Uh, new Bridgecom repeaters and SCOM controllers. And the intent was to link all these things using a VHF backbone. I'm happy to say all but one of these repeaters are in place and functioning. We do have uh, Echolink and IRLP going. Still need some fine tuning on squelch tails and things, but at least it's working. That's a good thing. We can control any link, uh, take any repeater up or down using DTMF tones from anywhere in the system. The next step is to each of these uh, controllers, wherever it is, uh, the controllers have uh, three ports on them, so we're, we're looking for some interop opportunities to interface with our favorite NIFOG frequencies or local whoever, so a lot more uh, growth that we can do there. Anyway, th this has been the main, main focus. Following this, we're going to revamp our mesh network uh, activities to create a network of last resort. We know the fiber never fails and everything else doesn't go down, but just in case. So if we have any DRATS experts out there, I'd love to uh, talk to you about that. But that, that's, that's kind of what's coming. We, we have had up to a 47 mile path on two gigs between the- I am so sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, we're looking forward to revamping that uh, mesh network into the world. So what, what will you do different next time? You saw that big whiteboard. We, we're going to create a lot of automated things to make that a little better. We, we lose a lot of history when we wipe things off, like our last 24 and next 24 goals and all that business. So we'd like to automate that. 
we had a lot of uh, rescue vehicles that didn't have radios in them, and they were coming to us during the storm, which kind of detracted a little bit from our activities. Always, help to, always helps to have some cash portables to hand out to folks when they show up. I mentioned a thing about making sure we could talk to the Navy helos and other air traffic. We, we do have the standard air traffic frequencies, but uh, F FAA pretty much shut down. It was crazy uh, in the air after the storms. Recordings, real important to go back for, through your AARs and figure out what, what to improve next time. And then uh, battery backup, even the EOC, <clears throat> excuse me, a generator at the EOC failed a few times. So we're going to get our own and get on solar power and all that kind of good stuff. We're, we're going to hold the questions until later on. However, could I take one or two? I have time to take one or two. If it, okay, good. Any uh, questions folks have? I know you were all out too late last night. Going once? Twice? Okay. Thank you, Rob.